Good morning, boys and girls. I'm Eleanor Hawkins, and welcome to Tell a Story Time. You know, I'm always talking to you about reading can be fun, and I hope you're learning that reading can really be fun, and that at bedtime that you're having a family reading time together where your parents read to you, and as you learn to read, you read to them. It's wonderful practice. And boys and girls, it's wonderful to have a family reading time together at bedtime. If you don't have that right now, please ask your parents to take a little time each night to read you at least one story, and then maybe they'll let you read to them. Try to have a bedtime story hour tonight. It's time for our story hour this morning, and our very first story is entitled, The Puppy Who Chased the Sun. At first, Wilbur did not chase the sun. In those days, Wilbur had his friends. Emma Jones was a friend, and Toothy Perkins was a friend, and No-Tail Ryan was a friend, and so was Fido. That was before Wilbur began to chase the sun. One morning, Wilbur woke up extra early. It was still dark because the sun had not come up. Wilbur crawled out of the apple box where he did his sleeping. None of his friends were awake. Wilbur was all alone. He wanted his breakfast. So he began to bark. He barked once. He barked twice. He barked three times, and the sun came up. It popped right up out of the darkness. At first, Wilbur was frightened because he had never seen the sun come up before. So he barked louder. Now, the louder Wilbur barked, the higher the sun rose. It seemed to Wilbur that it was his barking that chased the sun up into the sky. This made Wilbur very proud. He went around feeling proud all day. His friends wondered what was the matter with him. Emma Jones wondered, and Toothy Jones wondered, and no tell Ryan wondered, and so did Fido. They did not know that Wilbur was the dog who chased the sun up. The next morning, Wilbur woke up early again. He got out of the apple box where he did his sleeping. He faced toward the east, and he barked. He barked once, he barked twice, he barked three times and the sun came up. Wilbur barked louder and the sun rose higher. Wilbur chased the sun high up into the sky. This made him very proud. Wilbur's friends came to play with him, but Wilbur would not play. He was too proud to play with Emma Jones or Toothy Perkins or No-Tail Ryan or with Fido. <coughs> After a while, Wilbur's friends stopped coming to see him. Wilbur was lonely, but he was proud because Wilbur was the dog who chased the sun up. <clears throat> every day, Wilbur chased the sun up, and every day, Wilbur was prouder, but every day, Wilbur was lonelier because Emma Jones would not come to see him and Toothy Perkins would not come, and No-Tail Ryan would not come, and neither would Fido. But Wilbur was the dog who chased the sun up. <coughs> then one day, when Wilbur barked for the sun to come up, it didn't. Wilbur barked once. Wilbur barked twice. Wilbur barked three times. But the only thing that happened was that Wilbur got wet. He got wet because it was raining that morning. The next morning, Wilbur crawled out of the apple box where he did his sleeping. He faced toward the east, and he barked. He barked once. He barked twice. He barked three times. But the sun did not come up. 
The only thing that happened was that Wilbur got wet. He got wet because it was still raining. The sun would not come up when Wilbur barked. His friends would not come to see him, and Wilbur was wet. He crawled into his apple box, and he fell sound asleep. Then something happened. The rain stopped, and the sun came up. But Wilbur did not see it because he was asleep. The sun shone down on Wilbur's apple box, and the light and the heat and the heat woke up Wilbur. He looked up. He saw the sun. It was high up in the sky, and Wilbur knew that he had not chased it up there. So Wilbur thought about things, and this is the way he thought. Yesterday I barked, and the sun did not come up. Today I barked, and the sun did not come up. And then I fell asleep, and the sun came up. Wilbur thought some more. He thought once, he thought twice, he thought three times. And this is what he thought. I guess someone else gets the sun up. Wilbur was not proud after that. He hunted up his friends and he played with them. He played with Emma Jones and Toothy Perkins and No-Tail Ryan, and he played with Fido. Wilbur was happy again. He was much happier than before, back in the days when he thought he chased the sun up. And that, boys and girls, is the story of the puppy who chased the sun. And now stay tuned, and we'll be back in just a moment to show you books from the shelves of your public library. Boys and girls, this coming Monday is President's Day, and we have a book entitled just that, President's Day. And you can see inside that it tells us that President's Day is a national holiday that honors two of our America's greatest presidents, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Both Washington and Lincoln were born in February. Washington was born on February the 22nd, 1732, and Lincoln was born on February the 12th, 1809. President's Day celebrates both birthdays on the third Monday of each February. And over here is a very nice picture of Abraham Lincoln's boyhood home. And then here we have a very good portrait of George Washington. And on over, we have pictures of Mount Vernon, and here is the Washington Monument, and then here we have a very good picture of Abraham Lincoln. Yes, let's all uh, celebrate this next Monday when it will be President's Day. And then I brought along some good books for your bedtime story hour. This one is entitled, A Bedtime Book. And here we have the children listening to a story. And inside we have some delightful stories and very, very nice illustrations, as you can see. This story is The Little Boy and the Princess. All the way through very nice illustrations. This is entitled A Bedtime Book. And then I had to bring along this book. This is a sort of an odd shaped book. It's very tall and it's entitled The Tall Book of nursery tales. Inside, we have all of your favorites. Here, of course, is Little Red Riding Hood, and look at the wolf in the bed pretending he's her grandmother. All the way through, we have good illustrations in here. Of course, you can recognize the three bears. And then we walk, we look on, and we have that scary one, the wolf and the kids. Yes, some of your favorite stories are in this book, The Tall Book of Nursery Tales. 
And then one of my very favorite fairy tales is this one, Hansel and Gretel. And here we have the witch stepping out of that house of gingerbread with all the candy that surrounds it and is attached to the house. And here we have Hansel, and here is Gretel. And this is a very nicely illustrated book of this wonderful fairy tale, Hansel and Gretel. I brought along this book because it has some short stories in it that you might want to have at bedtime when your parents are so busy. It's entitled Little Owl's Bedtime Stories and it's especially good for preschoolers. Inside you can see we have one entitled The Sandbox Surprise and on over we have the school picture. All the way through, we have very good stories, The Basket of Apples. Yes, this is the book, Little Owl's Bedtime Stories. And last of all, I'd like to show you this book entitled The Bedtime Mother Goose. And inside we have some of those very favorite ones that we love. Here is Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And over here we have Little Willie Winky. And then here we have that old favorite, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Yes, this is the book entitled, The Bedtime Mother Goose. Boys and girls, any of these books can be checked out from any of the libraries in the Craven Pamlico Cardwick Regional Library System. Be sure and visit your library sometime during this next week and check out some very good books on your library card. And now stay tuned and we'll be back with another story in just a moment. Now, boys and girls, get ready to listen to the story of The Little Lost Kitten. Samuel and Jenny Fairfield were lucky to live in Williamsburg. It was the capital of Virginia. The houses had big yards enclosed by white fences. There were gardens and orchards in which to play and many important visitors to see. Their father made fine furniture in his large shop over near the coachmakers. Their own home on Francis Street was roomy and pleasant. The kitchen was in a small building in the backyard, and food was carried from the fireplace and from the brick oven there to the dining room in the big house. On this special Saturday, their porridge and milk were waiting for them. So was the mother cat. She lay in a wide basket near the fireplace. Her kittens tumbled about her. I heard your father say that you could visit your grandmother today, Belinda told them. How would you like to take one of the kittens to her? Oh, that would be fun, said Samuel. Jenny noticed one little kitten that climbed all over the others. She took the lively one into her hands. How soft and round it was. Hello, Tabby, Jenny said. Grandma will like you best and Samuel thought so too. Belinda tied a blue ribbon with a silver bell about the kitten's neck, and then she set her into a covered basket saying, now take good care of the kitten and don't lose her. Grandma lived on Prince George Street. Father said he was driving as far as the Capitol building, and then Samuel and Jenny could go on alone. He had to stop at the Capitol on business. Usually, Father rode on, har on horseback, but today he rode in his coach. Samuel sat up on the seat with Zeb, the driver. How proud he felt. He straightened his three-cornered hat and swished at his brass buckles with his kerchief. Jenny sat inside on the cushions. She smoothed her long, ruffled dress with her fingerless gloves. On her lap, she carefully held the basket 
with the kitten in it. Francis Street was busy. People were riding in coaches, chariots, or in chairs. Some were on horseback while others hurried along on foot. Soon the beautiful Capitol building, the seat of government in Williamsburg, came into view. I'll be back as soon as I can, Father promised as he got out. You watch the hustle and bustle so you can tell Grandma all about it. It was almost noon when he came out carrying a big envelope of papers. He gave it to Zeb, telling him where to deliver it. And then he turned to Samuel and Jenny. I have a surprise for you. We'll walk over to the Raleigh Tavern for dinner. On the short walk to the Raleigh Tavern, the three stopped in front of the apothecary shop to look in the window. What do you suppose is in those colored bottles? Samuel wondered. Oh, look at all the dried herbs. And Jenny, did you ever see such a big glass candy jar? The owner inside saw the Fairfields and he dipped his hand into the glass jar and came to the door. Greetings, Mr. Fairfield, he said pleasantly. A fine day to be out with your sturdy son and pretty daughter. Father smiled broadly at the apothecary, and the apothecary handed Jenny and Samuel each a sugary whorehound drop. Come along now, both of you, said Father, unless, of course, you're not hungry. The Raleigh Tavern was crowded, mostly with big, ruddy men, but the serving maid set the Fairfields down to a table in the corner. She brought them a great platter of meat and several covered dishes of vegetables, and you know there was steamed plum pudding for dessert. When they were finished, Father said, now I must get back to my shop. Can't waste a whole day, you know. We're on Duke of Gloucester Street. It runs from the Capitol to William and Mary College. Stay on this side and walk straight down the sidewalk. When you get to the end, turn right and go over one block. Then you'll be on Prince George Street and you'll see Grandma's house. Then Father was off. Oh, a shiver of excitement was in the air. Right next to Raleigh Tavern, there was a little wicket gate. It looked as if it wanted to be opened. Let's go through it, Samuel suggested. The magic wicket gate led into the brick courtyard of the bake shop. There was a smell of cinnamon and molasses and spicy apples. The master baker in a white cap and apron was waiting while his helper raked the coals from the open oven. Then he slid his flat loaves of bread behind the mince tarts. Well, it's my day for visitors, he exclaimed when he saw the children. George Washington dropped in a while ago on his way to William and Mary College. Where are you two going? Well, now, we're taking a kitten to Grandma, Samuel answered. May we watch you for a minute? The two visitors waited until the bread was lifted out on a wooden paddle. The baker then gave them each a brown mince tart. As Jenny set her basket down, a little white paw pushed up the cover. Jenny reached over and pushed the little paw back. They must keep the kitten in the basket. After saying goodbye to the baker, they went out the wicked gate and started down the busy main street. Samuel was swinging the basket with the kitten in it. In the barber shop across the way, they saw men working on wigs. And just then, one of the men crossed over twirling a curled wig in his hands. And when he saw Samuel staring at the wig, he said, Want to try it on? I'm on my way to deliver it. He lifted off Samuel's hat, handing it to Jenny to hold, and set the big wig on the small boy's head. Now look in the shop window, he laughed. The window was like a looking glass, and it showed a little boy with a big wig, curled head of hair. Even Samuel had to smile at himself, and people gathered to watch and somebody let out a shout. Oh, Jenny was frightened. She took the basket and pressed Samuel's hat into his hands. Please, Samuel, let's go. The kitten's scratching to get out. His hat on again, Samuel followed Jenny along the street, and they started 
And then they looked over at the big magazine with its eight sides. That was where the Virginians kept their gunpowder stored. The guard waved at them as they went by, and Jenny could smile again. They passed the market where corn and tobacco were being sold, and then they walked faster. They did want to see the governor's palace and the famous maze behind it. The quarter of a mile along the green grass did not seem very far. Now at last they were at the palace gate and the turnaround where carriages and horses drove up. A girl was rolling a hoop and a boy was bouncing a ball. They stopped playing to stare at the basket in Jenny's hands. Their puppy romped about them. What's in the basket? Oh, please, couldn't they see? Jenny said, well, well, just take a peek. As she lifted the cover, the puppy barked sharply and out leaped Tabby. She ran to the palace gate, Jenny right after her. Through the pansy bed she rushed and around the fruit trees and now she was in the holly maze far in the back of the palace. Samuel shouting behind Jenny cried out, I'll go for help. Jenny had heard of the famous holly maze. It had been planted for amusement, but sometimes even older people got lost in its winding paths. In and out went Jenny, in and out. A maze was supposed to be fun, but this was not fun. Jenny could not see Tabby. She began to shout and to cry. No one heard her. Nobody came to help, not even Samuel. If no one was coming to help her, Jenny knew she must help herself. She stopped sobbing. She had made too much noise. Noises frightened kittens. In a soft voice, she called, Come, kitty. There was an answering meow and the sound of a tinkling bell. Tabby came out of nowhere onto the path right in front of her. Jenny stooped to pick her up. And just then, the puppy barked again. And Tabby, frightened, scooted out into the open, running faster than ever. She scampered along the wall and into the turnaround in front of the palace. Now a young man was trotting up on a big white horse. Tabby was running right into the path of the horse with the big hoofs. Jenny shut her eyes tightly and held her breath. When she dared to open them, she was looking down at a pair of shiny boots with silver spurs. The young man had gotten off his big horse. Even as she gazed at a big brown hand, swooped up the kitten and handed it to her. A kind voice said, Here you are, little lady. A stray kitten is important to a little girl as a man's lost horse would be to a man. Jenny's grateful eyes traveled up to the bright blue eyes. Thank you, thank you very much. Who are you, please? My name's George Washington, the young man answered. I'm on my way back from William and Mary College where I went to see about my surveyor's license. I have an appointment with the governor. Glad I was on hand to help. Now Samuel came running and behind him was the governor's wife in a lace cap and rustling silk farthingale. George Washington doffed his hat and bowed low as a servant to his horse. I see that these children have had a good bit of excitement, said the governor's wife, in her kind voice. They might like to have a cup of Cambridge tea. She led them into the palace. Samuel and Jenny enjoyed their tea under the silver chandelier. It was not a long walk from the palace to Prince George Street, and they passed Bruton Parish Church, and both Samuel and Jenny said a quick prayer of thanks, and then they hurried to Grandma's house. Grandma liked Tabby, and Tabby liked her. The kitten's little white paws slapped at Grandma's ball of yarn. After supper, Father and Mother came with Zeb to take Jenny and Samuel home. They were much amused on the ride back to listen to the story the children had to tell. Did you remember to thank George Washington? Samuel asked his sister. Indeed, I did, replied Jenny. Who's George Washington? Mother asked. Oh, a surveyor, Jenny answered. He's the one who rescued Tabby. Samuel and Jenny Fairfield would never forget George Washington or his kindness. They never dreamed he would someday be President of the United States. 
And that is the story of the little lost kitten. And we'll be back in just a moment. Until next Saturday morning, this is Eleanor Hawkins saying bye-bye for Tell a Story Time.